Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kellyanne, and I'm a bookseller with Mysterious Galaxy. I am so excited to be introducing our authors tonight um, for our event. Tonight, we are hosting Alex London. He's the author of 25 books for children, teens, and adults, including Dog Tags, Tides of War, and Wild Ones for Middle Grade Readers. Tonight, we're celebrating his newest book, City of Thieves, which is the first installment in the Battle Dragons books. We also have, as you might notice, our conversation partner and moderator, Twee Sutherland, with us. Twee is the author of the Menagerie Trilogy, the Pet Trouble series, and a contributing author for the Erin Hunter team behind the Spirit Animals and Seeker series, but we all know her from their best-selling Wings of Fire series. Before I pass it off to the both of them, because I know you guys are here for them and not me, I'm sure you guys have all found the lovely live chat section. Uh, feel free to type whatever you want in there. Say hi to our authors during the event. And below us, there is a green button that says buy books with signed personalized book plates. We have book plates from Twee for her books and also are offering personalizations for Alex's book if you order it through Mysterious Galaxy. Just write in your order comments who you would like him to sign that to. And last but not least, there's the ask a question button at the bottom, which again, you guys have had no trouble finding. There's always already a ton in there. So an important thing to know is that you can upvote whatever questions you want answered. So if there's something that you are dying to know, make sure that you upvote it so that it gets answered. And with that, I'm gonna turn my screen off and let the event get started. Have a good one, you guys. Thanks so much. Thank it's you. Hi, Alex. Hi, so excited <laughs> to see you and to be here. Thanks for, for doing this with me. Oh, of course. I'm so excited. This book is so much fun. And I really feel like Wings of Fire fans, like what's not to love? It's exactly up their alley. So <laughs> I hope there are lots of Wings of Fire readers here tonight who are going to be like, oh, another dragon book and come read this because it's really awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, I'm a deep lover of dragons. Obviously, you paved so much of, of the way uh, writing <laughs> dragons. When, I, when, when I, the, the idea first came uh, and, and I was talking with Scholastic about it, uh, obviously yours was a comp title they brought up and, and the pitch was basically that we put together was it's the fast and the furious meets wings of fire <laughs> and i was like well okay let's let's get that uh, and that was kind of my driving thing the whole time <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i love that so much can i ask about is that a dragon behind you that's like changing colors that is a color changing 3d dragon lamp that someone gave me uh this wow. week what an awesome gift. It turns out you write a dragon book, you get a bunch of dragon stuff. Oh my gosh, can I tell you? Like, uh, my, my office is full of little dragons. Little dragons that people have made me. Little dragons. Oh, look at this cutie guy. Little oh. dragons. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> that's amazing. I, I still have a lot more coming your way. Three headed dragon from my daughter, my three. I have that one too. <laughs> <laughs> I, have not, I have not written a three headed dragon into Battle Dragons yet. Neither have I. I feel like it would be hard in Wings of Fire, but it would fit really well in your world. I feel like, oh my gosh, that would be so cool in your world. <laughs> like, how would you manage all three of them? Actually, it would be really fun to write if I put one in Wings of Fire, would be them just arguing with each other all the time. They would all have different feelings and they would be big feelings. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing book three in the series now and I just put in a myth about a three-headed dragon. So I feel like I'm getting there and entirely just because this puppet was sitting on my desk. <laughs> Inspiring you. Yeah. But I feel like because, because the book just came out, I feel like before we get into chatting with each other, I should tell people here who are a lot of Wings of Fire fans I'm seeing in the chat, which is awesome because I'm one too, uh, and am dying to ask you questions, but I'll be just weird. Um, uh, uh, just a little about what Battle Dragons is, right? Yeah, please uh, do, absolutely. And I'll do the quick. It's, uh, it's set in the futuristic city of Dracopolis, which is a city basically built around dragons. If you picture Venice with the canals and the boats, it's like that, except instead of water, it's the air, and instead of boats, it's dragons. They do everything. They're the taxis, they're the buses. But there is a criminal underworld where four gangs battle for control of this criminal underworld uh, in illegal midnight dragon battles uh, on souped up dragons. And our hero, Abel, who is 13 years old, gets caught up uh, for various reasons, in a, uh, a dragon battling gang. Uh, and with a stolen dragon caught between dynamics with his family, with his friends, uh, and with this dragon he has to learn how to master, um, even though he's afraid of heights and a little afraid of dragons, uh, and has to learn how to master this ferocious rare dragon, a sunrise reaper, and, uh, and win a battle against every element in his life and in this city. 
So it's a story about family and friendship and awesome dragons. Really awesome dragons, I have to say. I was actually really curious whether you've already made a list of all the different kinds of, I mean, I guess if you're on book three, you must have a lot more now, but like, did you start with a list of the like, all the different kinds? So this is the actual question I wanted to ask you too, because I, <laughs> <laughs> so I have my, this is the, the copy editing style sheet. So the, the problem was I did not make a detailed plan about the dragons. I kind of wrote with the like, whatever's awesome is what I'm gonna do next. Uh, and so I kept adding awesome elements. So like the first scene I thought of, which is a minor spoiler, I guess, but it's right at the beginning of the book, is where, where Abel meets his dragon. And it's I just envisioned this scene of this looking up, you're, you're, you're seeing this beautiful starscape in front of you. And then you realize, wait a minute, I'm inside. How am I looking at the stars? And you realize you're not. You're looking at the underside of a dragon's wing that camouflages itself looking like starlight. And when it opens its mouth to blow fire at you, it looks like the sun rising, and then you're incinerated. Um, <laughs> and I was like, that's so cool. Now I have to figure out the rest of that dragon and why that exists. So I created a, a taxonomy where I did, okay, there's going to be three basic kinds of dragons. There's going to be long wings, medium wings, and short wings. And within that, there'll be all the different, like, breeds and with the different abilities and all of that stuff. And then there'll be, like, the miscellaneous like, wingless dragons and the educational dragons they use in school. Um, and, but from that, I gave myself a lot of freedom. Wait, can I ask you, you have wingless dragons? Yeah, so there's the, um, there's, uh, I mention them very much in passing in the first book. They, they'll come to play a larger role as the series goes on. But so there's the educational resource dragons that they use <laughs> in the school. Um, Those are really funny. <laughs> so I mean, until they, they get scary. <laughs> yeah. Kids all call them not educational resource dragons, and they call them nerds for short, N-E-R-D. <laughs> um, but they're, they're the like, low rent they buy them in both schools buy them in bulk and they're these sort of very stupid dragons that don't fly or really do anything um and they have kind of a herd mentality where the rest of the dragons are very individualistic um so i kind of created those broad categories but i didn't really keep track i just kept making up awesome stuff and now as i'm writing book three i'm having to go back and like do word searches to be like wait what what was this dragon riding and what was its power and what color were its eyes <laughs> So oh my you're, yes. in book, you're in book 19, 20? Uh, no, I just finished 15, but there's a couple of like other ones in between. So it's the 17th one, actually. 17th one. So did you start with a plan? Do you have a running document that keeps track for you? <laughs> well, now I have the wiki online, which is extremely lovely and helpful That's of them. <laughs> so you use, you're hearing your first fans. You're using your fans to give yourself information about what you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do also, so actually what I did for a while is I put all the manuscripts in one giant manuscript. So it was like one big word document where I would just add in the latest manuscript and that way I could search just like you were talking about. I do like a search for, for each character and like, did I say that these two are related or was that just in my head? And like, you know, and sometimes it takes me a while to figure things out. But then I got to like the 10th book and my word document just exploded. It was like, I can't, what are you doing? <laughs> too many words <laughs> like wouldn't have anything to do with me anymore so that, I don't know the scholastic style sheet from the copy editor is really useful for that because they yeah. list every little thing you did so I need to organize it I'm gonna build myself a book bible yeah it's I think it's really way. helpful I do have like also a list of like a document of names like a dragon names document um where they're it's like listed out per tribe um and I do like Every once in a while, I get very, I'll, like at the beginning of a book, I'm like, okay, I'm going to like note when, when I use each name and like who it goes to and like how they're related. And by the halfway through the book, I'm like, bah, I can't keep going anymore. <laughs> it's slow, right? Like things start surprising you and you don't want to lose that by creating a dictionary. Yeah, exactly. You get all caught up and all excited. Yeah. Actually, so if you're working on the third one, is it is it a trilogy or is it going to keep going, do you think? Uh, the hope for all of us, it really depends how many people buy it, I think at this point, um, is that it keeps going uh, and becomes a long running series. So I have a sense of the arc that I want for this first series for Abel's story and his family. And I have the number of books in my head and where it goes. And then I have an idea for another arc of a couple of standalones that focus on some other things in the world. So hopefully that interests Scholastic too. <laughs> and then it, <laughs> it keeps going, but that's entirely up to readers. Uh, oh, that's so exciting! Because that was—I was wondering about that, like whether you, because I know you've done trilogies before and a duology. Um, mm. And I was wondering, like, do you plan it that way? Like, did you go into this thinking trilogy or 
five books or how big, how long is Abel's story? Can I well, ask? So originally when I sold it, I thought one book, I wanted to do a standalone. I was so tired of series writing and of keeping track of all these things. And like, I was like, I just want to write a standalone awesome adventure. Um, but Scholastic said, no, this is at least a trilogy. Um, <laughs> Here's money. So I was like, okay, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Make me write more about dragons. <laughs> I fell so in love with the world I was creating. I fell so in love with the city of Dracopolis and these characters in it and this family. Um, I hadn't expected to write Abel's parents into the book as much as I did. They oh. surprised me by being so relevant to the story um, and active in it in a way that didn't take away his agency. Because that's often yeah. the challenge, right, with writing kid main characters. You have to kill the parents or get rid of them somehow, and I didn't want to do that. Uh -huh. So giving his parents a role. I was like, I want more time with them too. And pretty soon I realized there is enough in this world that I could go wild. You know, I was, I was drawing on my love of like Akira and the old cyberpunk Blade Runner and all that cyberpunk stuff to build this city. And also all the fantasy dragons I loved. And, and I, I worked in some subtle references to things um, that I was like, there's just so much room. I want to build more. I want more of this world. Well, that was my, yeah, that's it. That was what I kept thinking. I was like, once you've built a world as cool as this, like, don't you just want to stay in it <laughs> like, as long as you can? So I'm glad to hear that. Hopefully. I, had to, I had to cut a lot of world building stuff that was just slowing it down. Um, so the number, so there's a, a scene, a very brief scene that takes place in a drag club where they do dragon drag, where humans <laughs> dress up as dragons and perform. Oh, that's right. I did see that part. Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> that was very cool. And the one with the, with the rainbow, the rainbow scales and the, the like rainbow, distracting everybody. Exactly. The rainbow, what did I call that dragon? The rainbow reaper. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, I wrote, I came up with so many different dragon drag names that I couldn't use. So <laughs> I need to keep writing more. <laughs> Just so I can use all of these great names. Just like one whole book set in that club. Yeah. At least. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, actually, it was interesting because I read, so I read this and I read Proxy and I started Black Wings Beating, which I'm reading right now. And what I, what's been really interesting about all three of them is that your world building has a sense of history to it. Like, it's not just like, here's a cool world. It's like, here's a cool world that's been here for a while and here's some stuff that happened before we're just going to hint at. And um, I really love that. Like, I think that's one of like the neatest things about good world building. Um, so I'm really hoping we get to see a little more because there's a there's like a story in here about sort of the history of how dragons and humans like started getting along. I have yeah. suspicions about that story. <laughs> yeah, I <bet> you do. <laughs> yeah I, I've had a lot of fun thinking of of the mythology of of the world and why why it is and why people see and treat dragons the way they do and why dragons see and treat themselves the way they do and treat each other the way they do and. You know, I think it's one of the big questions I ask myself about world building. And I think this is something you do so well in, especially in the first story arc um, of Wings of Fire, is what does, what does everyone in the book, I always ask myself, what does everyone in the book know about their world and what's true about their world? Yeah. Because some of those things are different, right? And who's lying and why? Like, exactly. what did I get from it? Exactly. <laughs> Um, and so figuring that stuff out is great because then you can drop scenes and it's not like everyone spends all day long talking about the history of the place they're in. It's, you know, I live in Philadelphia. We've got a ton of history here. But I don't walk around all day being like, oh yes, that is the house where James Madison did that thing. It's like, no, but you're aware of it and it does come up occasionally. <laughs> Right, and it's cooler that way because it's like, oh, what does that mean? And what does that mean? Yeah, I try to like, I have little things that I'm hinted at that I haven't gotten all the way into yet, but hopefully we'll get to things. And I think it's, it gives fans more fun things to do, right? To imagine their way into the story, to imagine what, what's the backstory there? The things, it, you're creating a sandbox for other people to play. Yes, absolutely. That's my favorite thing about world building like this is like the sense of like, well, then now people can write their own stories in this world and create their own dragons and stuff too. Which is very cool. Um, do you know all that beforehand? Like, do you start with the whole like history in your head, or is that as you go along? You're like, here's a good thing that would be cool to drop in, and then it, it develops. Kind of, I sort of reverse engineer it, so I kind of I, I tend to start with characters and and kind of a vibe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and as I build that, I learn as I go, and then I go back and revise and make it look seamless. Um, but often I only learn in the first draft what the mythology of the world is as the characters need to know it or as I need to hide it from them. As like, you know, Abel will do something and someone else is lying to him about something and I have to then figure out why. Why did this person lie? And that builds out the lie for me. And then I go back and, and make it neater. But it's mostly because I don't outline. 
So my first draft is real layout like. <laughs> Oh my God, me too. And I, 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 as I always say, I'm like, it'd be really helpful to be an outlining kind of author in a writing a 15 book series. <laughs> yeah, I'm shocked you don't outline. I always assumed you were like a really detailed outliner. I was gonna message you before all this to be like, cause I'm writing book three and I'm stuck in this one part. And I was like, gonna ask you for outlining advice, but you don't do it. You're useless to me. What am I doing? I am, I am sorry. I mean, usually actually what I'll do is I, uh, okay. I have like a few images in my head that I'm like, these are gonna show up in the book, like a few scenes usually. And then sometimes I know the ending, like with book eight, I knew the ending. Cause I was like, that's where we're going. Um, not with book 15. <laughs> book 15, the one I just did, I was like, well, I don't know, let's see what happens. Um, so, <laughs> oh no, I'm scared now as a reader. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think it turned out kind of cool. Like I feel like that's more fun because if I don't know the ending then I'm not telegraphing it as I'm writing it, yeah. Um, so, you know, like not knowing how book five was going to wrap up, I didn't drop too many hints ahead of time because I couldn't. Because you had no clue. Yeah. But you know what's really hard is writing a prophecy in book one that has to come true by book five and not knowing quite what's going to happen there. Yeah. So. One, of, one of the things I wanted to do in this book that was both part of my storytelling mission, but also making my life easier as an author was not having any sort of prophecy that I had to <laughs> film because I didn't. I kind of didn't want to write a chosen one narrative. Um, I really wanted to write a narrative about a group of kids who see a problem and go to fix it with the resources they have. Um, they are choosing to be the heroes uh, in a very unheroic world. It's yes! chosen by their world. Um, and, and I felt like that was a fun experiment to do and they'll fall short and there's a lot of moral gray area in their world and they, they they're all trying to be their best selves. Uh, Cause I really think it's important to celebrate. We're, we're very good as a society at hero narratives, mm -hmm. but hero narratives are rarely the reality of how change happens. Yeah. Um, we're usually it's, it's movements, it's communities. Um, it's, it's people learning when they're not the center of the thing and yeah. learning to work towards something that is not about them, which, you know, uh, especially for a white man is hard to unlearn in America. Um, <laughs> and, and so, I wanted to tell a story where that, where, you know, Abel is the main character and he is, he is the protagonist and it is his action and choices that drive the story. But there is no, he's not the chosen one and there's no way he can do it alone. Um, and yeah. he doesn't bring everything to the table. Uh, and at the end of the day, he has to realize, you know, it's not even about him, it's about the dragons. Uh, yeah, I love that. And he, and, and Roa, Roa and Topher, Roa, right? Yeah, Roa and Topher. Who are like so important, I think yeah. also. Yeah, I, was, I mean. I was nervous to write, to, uh, to write Roa. Uh, who's non-binary um, because I am not, it's not an experience I have. And so I had to do a lot of, you know, sharing with friends and be like, Hey, am I getting this right? Is this, is this uh, strange? And I knew writing a book for younger readers, some of whom would, many of whom are non-binary themselves or have siblings or whatever, but also many of whom won't have any idea what that is and figuring out in the world building, how to introduce that in a way, in a world where, where, uh, homophobia and gender phobia and all of that stuff doesn't exist because there's there's no homophobia in the world of battle dragons there's they don't police gender and sexuality the way our world does I didn't want to report that so how do I introduce a concept in a realistic way in the world without being like and now here's the after school special portion um, and now, so like, can I tell you the craziest thing there's a non-binary human in book 15 and I had to do the same thing I had to go through the, I was like well but they're all just like yeah of course Right. So how do I explain it, but also be like, oh, of course, you know, how yeah. you put it in. It was, yeah, it is tricky. Yeah. I think it's important. Um, I think it's great to have, um, give, you know, to have worlds like that, to have our fantasy yeah. worlds, not have the problems that our world has. Yeah. And so the, first, the first time I wrote it, the first draft, there was a scene where Topher, I needed to establish him as a bully. He bullies Roa uh, and misgenders them. Uh, and I realized that was so not working. That wasn't the world I wanted created. That also made him too unredeemable. Um, and it, it just did all the, it wasn't right to the world. And I realized I couldn't, he got smacked down pretty hard for it in the scene, but I didn't even want that to be the way it was happening. I, I wanted him to be a bully who never would even think to bully someone about that. Um, mm -hmm. and so I had to rewrite the scene with that, with that in mind. Yeah. I, I, I think you do a great job actually with Topher. Like, I feel like he is someone who you, you get to sort of see him from the outside and gradually be like, oh, this is what's really going on with his life. And it's yeah. very interesting. <laughs> um, I want to go back to the chosen one thing, because that's something I think about a lot, too. Like, I, that's actually why 
all the Wings of Fire books are each one's a different protagonist because that's mm -hmm. something that I'm hoping I'm conveying that like um, anyone can save the world. You know, everyone has to be a part of it. Like you're not, it's not just one person or dragon. Yeah. <laughs> They're all working together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love that so much. Um, uh, ooh, I wanted to ask you what which of the kin you are because I took that quiz on your I, on your website. Oh yeah, I forgot. I should tell everyone there's a there's a, a which kin. So there's four main kins in Dracopolis. The, the gangs we call them kins because you know why not? It sounds cool. Um, uh, <laughs> and there are four main ones. Uh, the the red talons who are the most powerful, most brutal, most vicious, and richest uh, of the kins. Uh, and control the most territory. They control the neighborhood where our hero lives, and you know, so they're they're very scary. Um, and they want they value uh, power more than anything else. Um, and they're kind of in league with the police. They pay off the police, and so they're kind of tied to the state, even though they're criminals. Um, then there are the Thunder Wings, who value knowledge above all else. They're the scientists, the veterinarians. They run the illegal dragon veterinary clinics. Uh, <laughs> they are the hackers. They are the spies. Uh, they're the techies, they're the teachers, uh, they infiltrate, you know, everywhere, because um, knowledge is what they value. Then there are the, uh, the Sky Knights who value justice above all, and they serve a cause of the liberation of people from this corrupt system, but only people. They don't really care about dragons, and they actually don't care about individual people. They care about their cause, and they're willing to sacrifice anyone and anything to achieve this liberation and to achieve what they see as justice. So they're, they're noble aims, but brutal methods. And then there are the Windbreakers, whose name just makes me giggle every time. <laughs> um, and uh, they are on the side of chaos. They're anarchists. Um, they have, they control no territory. They battle no dragons. Um, and they believe in causing chaos and mocking and undermining you know, the system. They don't want to exploit the system. They want to blow it up. Uh, and so those are the four kids. I almost don't want to say which one I'm in, but I did because uh, I feel like it would it would favor one, but I did create uh, a which kin are you in quiz. So I'll drop in the chat a link to that. So people, so I dropped it into the chat. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to say what I am though. Okay. though I think if you read the book, you can probably tell which one I'm, I'm in and, <laughs> and feel affinity towards. Um, but I'm always curious the one, so I got to know which kin you landed in from the quiz. I ended up in the Sky Knights, which surprised yeah. me a little. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of writers uh, end up in the Sky Knights. It's either Sky Knights or Thunderwings. Uh, I'm, um, I'm always a little wary when they end up in the red town. Well, because the Sky Knights are, I think the closest where a lot of us are idealists, right? You get into storytelling, you, know, you have a, a vision of how the world could be, and you want your stories to help get it there. That's what activists do. I mean, like, so it, it makes sense that you would be a Sky Knight. I hope you're not as uh, vicious. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, in, not in real life, just in my books. <laughs> Obviously, I feel some affinity for Sky Knights. You know, a major character who is beloved is a, is a Sky Knight. So, you know, mm -hmm. they're cool. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask you in the, um, they do some symbol with their hands, like some kind of infinity symbol. Is that a thing you could show us? Do you know okay, how I can do? I've pray it's, ah, okay. I, I, <laughs> Totally. You know, it's you. I'm not doing it well. You make a, someone surely knows how to do it. You make an infinity symbol with your hands, but I'm failing at it. Yeah, it's basically like that. Yeah. Like, there it is. Yeah. Sorry, it's 10 p.m. here. And I'm <laughs> yeah, you just make a little like, boom. Got it. Okay, cool. Got a little gang sign. <laughs> I like you know, that. I'm teaching the children about joining gangs. <laughs> well, I like so, cool gangs, because they're, they're going to cool be the dragons, so. <laughs> and they mostly get their comeuppance for their criminality. <laughs> That's right. Really, the, the good guys are the ones that are like on the side of the dragons, which is the, the best <laughs> thing. <laughs> do, um, speaking of which, do you have other like favorite dragon stories? Are there like dragons that you loved before yeah. all this, like growing yeah. up? Or and I drew on a lot of them uh, when you know when starting. I I started to think about like the dragon mythology I love, what I was going to use, what I was going to twist. Um, and one of my favorite interpretations of dragons that I in no way got to use. Um, was was Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea dragons? Oh, yeah. um, their their relationship to language uh, and power, their ancient wisdom that is brutal. Um, I love that. Um, so the Earthsea, the dragons in, in Earthsea are just some of my favorite. Um, I also I love dragons love tacos, so I put a reference into that <laughs> because the dragons love tacos. I have a three year old, so I spent a lot of time reading that picture book. Um, so I had to. <laughs> I noticed that. I was like, wait, that's got to be a reference. Yeah. <laughs> like, like Karak is like, settled down. He's a very violent dragon, but he's totally calm by, by talking. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> it's the great thing about writing a dragon, a contemporary world, you know, a realistic city, is I can do stuff like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's true. I can't put tacos in Wings of Fire. I mean, that'd be tricky. <laughs> there's music to come up with how that works. <laughs> uh, but I love inventing fantasy world food. I'm kind of bummed. You know, I got I got to invent a wyvern wafers, which are the chocolate candies they eat. In the first three drafts, those were just Kit Kats in, in fun flavors, because I love Kit Kats. Um, and I was really hoping to become a brand ambassador for Kit Kats by shamelessly putting product placement in. But it didn't work out, and my editor made me change it. So they're now wider. Um, other dragons I love, I think the, um, the it's not a kid's series, but um, the Temeraire series, His Majesty's Dragon. Oh, yeah. It's one of the coolest. Napoleonic, for those of you who don't know it, the Napoleonic Wars, but with dragons. Um, it's like Master and Commander but with dragons. It's so cool. They're so, the world building is so astonishing and so specific. Um, and the dragon, this is, that's one where the humans and the dragons do communicate with each other. Yeah. And like, there's, um. so for the first, like several books, it's all from the human's point of view, but there's a little bit of Temeraire. And then suddenly there was a book where a lot of it was from Temeraire's <laughs> point of view. Oh my God, and I loved it so much. I was like, why was it always like this? <laughs> Poor Temeraire. He's really funny. Um, and she also does a great job of like the different kinds of dragons. Like, yeah, she gets very specific. She writes whole scientific like tracks about the dragons in the like afterwards. They're like skeletal system. I'm not that fancy. <laughs> <You> know, <same. laughs> like how their different weapons work and stuff. I have been trying. I do have to think about how their different weapons work because the battles are so key. And they play that. There's a card game in the book called Dracotech that's kind of like a little bit Pokemon, a little bit Magic the Gathering. Um, that I dream of one day it being a real card game. So I had to think a little bit about their breath weapons, their strengths, their weaknesses, so that someone could one day make the card game. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that happens. I totally want that card game. I would, I would so play that. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Um, I love this book, too. Have you read Tooth and Claw? No, I don't even know Tooth and Claw. It's really good. Yeah. It's also adult. It's also really technically an adult book. Sorry, readers. <laughs> I'm sure there are some older readers here tonight. Um, it is like a, uh, she, she calls it Trollope, but with dragons. So if you don't know Trollope, it's sort of Jane Austen, but with dragons. But it's like a little more, um, the sensibility is slightly different, but it's really funny. Like it's, it's they're all the main characters are dragons and they just live in this very like sort of 18th century feeling like, um, oppressive society with like lots of rules and lots of etiquette. <laughs> it's very hilarious and really smartly yeah. written. Do you have a, a favorite or maybe a top two dragons from pop culture that you think are like, that you didn't write, you can't pick your own? <laughs> you are allowed to pick mine, however. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a top, like a top favorite pop culture dragons? It's so hard. I mean, the sort of obvious one that comes to mind is Toothless. Like, yeah. who doesn't love Toothless? <laughs> well, let me ask that differently then. If you could ride any dragon that's not your own creation, what dragon would you want to ride? Hmm. I guess you can say Toothless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Toothless feels the safest. Like, I don't I don't think I would want to ride Smog. Like, I feel like that wouldn't go well. That yeah, would not go well. <laughs> And then like the other dragons, like I love these books, the little, the tea dragon society, which are like, <laughs> they're like your books, but like the opposite. They're like, yeah, exactly. they're the opposite. <laughs> the dragons be tiny and adorable. Yeah, they might be the perfect opposite actually. <laughs> <laughs> which is the great thing about dragons, that you can have these and yours and like, and all, just like so many different kinds. Well, that's what I love about dragons, right? Like they are, you can put so much of, of humanity can be learned through dragons. There's a reason we're all so drawn to the dragon. I think one of the reasons I write middle schoolers and dragons specifically a combination is because I think that is such a powerful juxtaposition where you've got these powerful creatures and these young people who are just coming into their own autonomy but don't really have any power. So they're starting to realize that the world is not quite what they think it is and that they're trying to get their own sense of identity, but they don't have any power. And suddenly you pair them with a dragon. What, what, is, a, what is a middle schooler gonna do with a dragon? I think it reveals a lot. I think, I think power doesn't change you. Uh, I think it reveals you. And I think what a cool way to reveal characters is through dragons. And I think we all do that in our dragon books, that we use dragons to say something about humans. I think weirdly, dragons make us more human. And our relationship to dragons teaches us what it is to be human. 
Oh, I love that. Yeah, I think that's really true. I know people ask me a lot at these events, like, why do you write about dragons? And I was like, who wouldn't want to write about dragons? I don't know how to answer that question. I think they're awesome. <laughs> I think they're awesome, but they're so much more than awesome, right? Yeah, like, yeah that's really true. And that, you know, I, I like to say they're kind of, they feel to me like they, um, like, like superheroes, like they all can fly in my, in my world and they, you know, some of them can breathe fire, some of them can do other things, but you're right. It is about like what you do with that power and like, um, yeah. And how, and how it interacts with the world and the problems in the world around you. So it's really have, cool. have, you, have you invented any cool breath weapons that you've, you've never used that you're allowed to say, is there anything cool that you haven't been able to use? I don't think so. There's the ice dragons that freeze you with their breath, which I have used. And then there's the, what the ring wings, uh, the venom that they spit. And I don't think there's another one that hasn't come up yet. Yeah, not that I, I mean, I mean, yes. And just, just keep reading and you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, am I what? I think it's yeah. a, not too much of a spoiler to talk about the dragon in your book that shoots like gems, like shards of gems. Oh yeah, yeah, we can talk about the dragon. Power. Oh my god, that is so cool. Yes, yeah, so the, the 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 widow maker. Um, oh, yes. and they shoot, yeah, they shoot uh, jagged jewels, and so there's different ones that shoot different different jagged shards of glass, basically. Um, yeah, that was something I'd never seen before, and that was uh, very exciting. Yeah, I started to think I didn't want to just do the standard breath weapons because I thought you're matching these dragons in interesting battles with each other, and you have to get from strengths and weaknesses. I thought it was just like fire and ice and fog and acid clashing. Like, okay, that's fun, <laughs> but it's going to get tiresome eventually. Uh, so I was like, I want to start making up cool, interesting powers. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, the, the jagged gems that shoot shrapnel, I thought was, oh, that's cool. How does the biology of that work? Um, but I figured it out. Um, yeah, it made a lot of sense. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> because the city of Dracopolis was surrounded by desert that then the warring dragons in ancient history burned to, to glass. You've got all this glass out there that I figure, oh, dragons could, like, eat it and digest it into their system. And certain breeds have, like, ways of digesting it that have evolved that let them shoot these jewels. That's what I decided. <laughs> and also it works really well because of the, the sort of, like, the urban setting, like, is very... Like there's so much collateral damage from like sh flying jewel shards everywhere. Yeah. Like it adds to the effect of like you could just be standing anywhere and suddenly dragons are battling overhead. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and I'm a very visual person, so I I really play the movie out in my head and just write down what I'm seeing. So just for me, the image of these jewels shooting through the street past billboards and neon signs and crashing into a wall as another dragon shoots fire just like work. Uh, I did. I did. I can. I can spoil book three because it'll be you know a year and a half, two years before it comes out, so no one will remember. Um, I did just invent the creepiest power for a dragon that I just want to share because I thought of it the other day and I'm excited. Um, it, it shoots spikes of bone, and you hear it. You get a warning because you hear this like cracking sound as it prepares to spit out bone at you. And I was like, oh, that's so creepy. I gotta use it. <laughs> Is it like its own bones that it's like, or is it like, yeah. okay, oh my gosh. And then it reproduces, it like obviously regrows bone quickly. Uh, <laughs> and shoots out spikes. Ah, oh, it's so creepy. I creep myself out just talking about it. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my God, I'm so excited to read it. <laughs> <laughs> is book two? Is it on a year schedule? So like we get book two. Year book, now? book two will be in the spring, um, and book three will be then I think the next fall, assuming I get it done in time. Oh my gosh, that's awesome! Yeah, I that's... did a lot. <laughs> They're not short books, um, so I'm like, ah, how am I going to get it done in time? But having a three year old too doesn't help. Yeah, no. Oh my god, that was me. That was um, the when I started Wings of Fire. It was on a six month schedule, and I had a baby, and then I had another baby. <laughs> And then I just like fell apart and I was like, maybe one a year. <laughs> <laughs> one, one baby a year or one book a year? <laughs> one book a year. <laughs> two babies, quite enough for me. <laughs> two babies and two fur balls. Can I introduce my puppy? Because I've I posted about her on Instagram. Oh, is he? <laughs> oh, this is very exciting. The new puppy. The new puppy. <laughs> she's never, she's so like, my other dog has been on several events, but this is Bumblebee's first event. That was Bumblebee? Bumblebee. Is there a story behind Bumblebee's name? Um, it's one of the dragons in Wings of Fire. So, cause I was like a little bit thinking like I've written 15, 17 Wings of Fire books. Um, I should get a puppy. <laughs> I deserve a puppy. Um, Why of all the names? I mean, you've named so many dragons at this point. Why is that dog Bumblebee? 
Um, I so I actually gave my children like a list, and I was kind of like, it doesn't have to be a dragon because you know I have a nine year old and an eleven year old. So I was like, if you want to choose a different name, that's okay. Um, but if you want to choose a Wings of Fire <laughs> name, feel free. I actually was really, I really would have liked Kinkajou or Cricket because they're two of my favorite dragons and they have really good personalities. But the kids loved Bumblebee, who is um, this tiny little dragon that shows up in like books twelve and thirteen, who is a pain in the butt. <laughs> kind of a holy terror so i'm like mm, let's not have bumblebee's personality let's not <laughs> oh let's please not <laughs> well, that's i found one of the most fun things is inventing the dragon personalities and i think it's something you do so well writing such a massive cast of dragons who all have such distinct personality um, <laughs> i mean it helps that they can talk but <laughs> um, yeah yeah <laughs> uh, but so writing these dragons and trying to make sure they feel distinct and especially as the series series goes on abel is going to meet a lot of dragons um, and uh, and figure out how to make them all distinct and give them dragony personality. I think is is really hard. So I I, I just want to yeah. praise you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really fun writing the little ones like Bumblebee and like you know when there are kids around me all the time. So um, that was it was not too hard to reach back and remember. <laughs> um, there, when yeah. you're writing when you're writing your dragons, is there? Do you think of them? Do you create like? animal analogs to them are you like importing in your imagination like oh this dragon has like horsey vibes and this one has like cat vibes <laughs> that's really funny i haven't done horse and cat yet <laughs> <laughs> i mean the tribes are, are are have um certain animal characteristics like embedded in them so like you know the sky wings have scorpion tails and the uh, mud wings are sort of loosely based on crocodiles and then um for the new for the books on the uh on the on the new continent, I did mm -hmm. um, you know a bunch of research to into insects. So there could be like the butterfly dragons and then like the scary insect dragons, and that was that was no fun watching the insect documentaries. Not my favorite thing. Oh. <laughs> Talk about creepy! If you're looking for like creepy things your dragons can do, like just anything about insects will give you all yeah. kinds of nightmares and good ideas. <laughs> Are there going to be like the zombie? You know those ants or the ants? The, the, okay, I won't. Yes. <laughs> I can't say any more about that, but absolutely. Um, I find those like the most interesting and creepy of yeah. all the like insect plant interactions in the world. So yeah. you know, as I was thinking about this conversation, I got to I was daydreaming about world building and I was like, there is a universe. And I'm not saying this is canon. I'm I'm saying this is just me daydreaming it uh today. There's a universe actually where the events of uh battle dragons take place thousands of years in the future from wings of fire there's a universe oh, that makes complete <laughs> sense <laughs> i totally could see that absolutely okay i'm getting yelled at in the chat because i said sky wings and i clearly meant sand wings <laughs> now i want to be like well um it's uh it's 10 p.m here except that's when my day starts so i have no excuse <laughs> i am a i am a, I'm a night owl writing person yeah, um, I, yeah I, well, actually i could totally see that like what do the dragons do to each other that ends up with the world of battle dragons it'd be really funny <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking ahead and had the chat open. Now I'm looking at it to see. I always enjoy, I always enjoy the trolling that occurs. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm going to look at these uh, the questions from the yeah, yeah. and see if I can I can do this. Um, all right. There's one that says, "Do you have any scrapped content from the book that you're allowed to share with us?" Do you want to go first? No, you go first. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it just came out, so most people haven't read it, so it, it's hard to spoil because well, you don't know even what I'm spoiling, so it's like, you know, whatever I want. Um, for me, it was a lot, a lot of the world building stuff it was just slowing down the plot. Um, so just a lot of, of, like, fun games they play and food they eat. Um, I created this whole illegal market for dragon parts. There's, like, wow. poachers who poach dragon, and it was too gruesome. Uh, <laughs> so I, I had to remove that. Um, there were some. I feel like the equivalent in my world would be the market where they sell parts of humans. It's like, here's a charred human arm. And yeah. <laughs> but I did not even think of that. No. Yeah, it's really gruesome. I might reference it later in the series that it exists. It's just like a dark underbelly of Gregopolis. But, uh, but it was way too gruesome. Um, and that, and I, I wanted to spend, I spent, wanted to spend a lot more time in the drag club, but it just, you know, it's a middle grade novel and I just couldn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to spend more time, I wrote a whole scene uh, in the illegal veterinary clinic 
uh, but it just was slowing down the plot. Um, so I, anything that was cool and kept the plot moving, I kept in. So it's not like I cut any any awesome revelations that that will later come out. It's like I used my best ideas. Uh, mm. I'm not I'm not holding anything back from readers, you know. Um, sorry, my puppy is now trying to chew the things on my desk. <laughs> I have all these papers on the floor and I was trying to get some work done today and now they're all nibbled around the edges. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think for mine, the, the one that I always think of when people ask me this question is um, that when I first started the very first book, the, um, the first scene that popped into my head was the hatching scene where all the little prophecy dragons hatch together. Um, and I actually wrote it. And I wrote it a few different ways and I wrote it with more dragons and I wrote it from different points of view. Um, and then I realized when I kind of figured out how many dragons there should be, how they connected to the prophecy and like what the arc of the first book was going to be, it kind of gave away too much about the character arc that I mm -hmm. like he, there's a secret that play finds out by the end of the book wow. that would have been revealed if I had, if I had included that scene. Yeah. Um, because it was, you know, from his point of view and it showed all the like feelings he was having, which, um, is sort of what he discovers later. Um, but it does, I think, end up in the graphic novel. Oh, I was going to say, do you find that so that maybe you and I know how complicated these things are and maybe you don't want to talk about it, but I know people are very interested in the Netflix show. Um, oh. <laughs> Chris, does that stuff you, you used and know and didn't write, does that come up? Do you get to like talk to the producers or the screenwriters about it and be like, hey, here's what's going on? Like They're engaging you in those conversations? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. Okay, puppy, stop eating my books. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually really exciting because the the showrunners are are very into the books. Like they they have a daughter who's read them all, and they have read them all with her, and so they're they really get them. You know, they're not just like oh cool dragons. Like they really understand the books and like what I'm doing with the themes and stuff. Um, and so it's yeah. So we can I can talk to them about like you know a thing I didn't get to include is this, or like, wouldn't it have been fun to spend more time on this? Um, and who knows, like, I can't say for sure, like this will end up in the series. Right. Or this. You don't have power. this is the thing people need to know about Hollywood is the, the writer of the book it's based on are the least powerful people involved. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I already feel like I'm getting to see more than like most writers. Like they're so kind about including me in like conversations and showing me stuff. Um, but also it's just, it's really far away. So a ton of things could change between now and then. Like it's a long process. Um, you know, the, the, the great thing about being an author is like, I can do the entire thing myself here in my room in the middle of the night, but like a TV show, there's like hundreds of people involved. Yeah. I feel like they introduce me to new people every month and it's just my screen is just full of little boxes and I'm like, oh, how am I going to keep track? <laughs> yeah. um, but it is very exciting. I think the art is amazing. I think that um, I think the writers are incredibly cool. I've gotten to meet all the, the writers they've hired for the writer's room and like they're just really interesting, thoughtful people that ask really interesting, thoughtful questions that make me think like, oh, why can I do that? And like, how does that fit? into the bigger story and how can we show it visually because there's so much they can do that I can't do right. but there's some that I that they can't like I'm like well why don't we have some inner monologues I'm like I have a lot of feelings I think we should feel his feelings so <laughs> like, well, she is so not a screenwriter <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, I'm, so excited. Excited me, but I, I'm so excited so I can't wait I'm pretty excited too I think it's going to be fun um Fun to work on and fun to, to like see what happens as it goes along. Um, okay, so they ask, how did you come up with the idea for Battle Dragons and how many books do you want to write for it? You kind of sort of answered that, or do you want to add anything? Yeah, so they, how many? I mean, I would go infinite. I think there's so many stories. I hope I created a world that feels big enough. Um, right now, I, I'd like to tell Abel's story in, I think, four books, if I can. Um, but then I have lots of other stories to go with and intersect and the prequels and post after things and simultaneous <laughs> and all of that stuff. I've got so much in my head. Um, uh, but the idea itself was just taking things I'm passionate about. Um, I love sci-fi. I love fantasy. So I wanted to write a mashup. Um, I love the Fast and the Furious movies. And I wanted to write something with that kind of fun that just feels like, like just play and that just like big, huge things happen that are so over the top and just exciting and fun and funny. But then with real heart, you know, like those Fast and the Furious movies are all about like family, you know, Vin Diesel saying family, really intense ways. Um, and I wanted something with, with that kind of heart that is about a community and about people, a lot of flawed people doing their best in difficult situations. Uh, and, and I feel like 
that's what's going to hopefully drive people through the series. Uh, dragons are awesome, and people want to read about them, and that's great. But ultimately, it's the characters and their relationships and their wants and needs and hopes and shortcomings that are going to make readers care and stick with the series. And I, I just I fell in love with these characters. I wanted to write about a kid who's a lot like I was, you know, in middle school, being anxious, uh, not thinking you measure up. He's got two older siblings who are both in their own ways very accomplished. Um, mm -hmm. And he feels like he doesn't measure up and never will. And and having those feelings and then the wish fulfillment side, the fantasy side, is now you've got a giant murderous dragon at your beck and call. Um, <laughs> what would that be like to like not just master the dragon, but master yourself, master your own anxiety, your own confidence, your, your friendships? Um, so, yeah, uh, I wanted to explore those themes of what it's like to be 13. Uh, but also to have dragons in a futuristic city run by criminal <laughs> writing games. I think you do it really well. It's a great balance of that feeling of being 13 and then and then getting a cool dragon. Like it kind of <laughs> is like, it, it, it's all in there and you do it amazingly. So. And, and when we talk about gaming, like you mentioned the card game, you know, that they play, like I wanted, I, I think gaming is such a big part of young people's lives now that to write a realistic story, I, I, they had to play games, right? Like that's just like, young people do, but I wanted the games to be relevant to their life and to what they have to do. It's the knowledge they have from gaming informs the story. And so I got yeah. to play with that, uh, that it wasn't just some thing they did on the side that didn't matter. It matters to how they succeed or not. Yeah, and then he's and he thinks about it as he's doing the battling. He's like, now I know this is more, more powerful than this because of the game. It's right. really cool. <laughs> it's really smart. Um, I think we're, we're almost at our last oh. couple questions. Okay. So, just want to throw you a couple. Uh, one is, how do you get your books done by the publish date? <laughs> <laughs> do you have any advice? It's, <laughs> it's, it's every book, right? So this, I think, Battle Dragon is my 25th or 26th book, and it's different every time. This is the first book I wrote during a global pandemic uh, with a three-year-old, at the time a two-year-old stuck at home. I wrote it a lot during her naps. Um, most of it was written while she was napping in the afternoon. Uh, my husband's a teacher, and so he was teaching online all day, uh, and I had to be oh watching. Oh my gosh! Oh, oh, it was brutal. It was brutal, but because it was so brutal and so stressful and everything, um, and you know, by the end of the day, he was exhausted, I was exhausted, our child was exhausted. Dracopolis became my escape. I wrote this book. It was a joy to sit down every day. I got to spend time in this imaginary world that I love, uh, and you know, like. Yeah, I basically was like either watching Avatar The Last Airbender uh, uh, on uh, Netflix or writing this book. And like those were my escapes. Um, and, and so that's how I got it done. I, I genuinely wanted to get back to the computer and work every day. Um, oh, that's so nice. But uh, now I don't know. <laughs> now I'm just <laughs> We have to lock you in the house again with nothing yeah. else to do except write book uh, four. <laughs> I bribe myself. I don't know if you do something like this. I bribe myself with things. So, I'll, like, I love Kit Kats, so I'll buy Kit Kats and put them on my desk. Like, I can't do that until I get my writing goal for the day done, my work count or my scene or whatever I set for myself. And then I get to eat Kit Kat. I fail half the time and just eat the Kit Kat anyway. <laughs> um, and for me, it's like, it's even worse. It's like I just, I bring some kind of little dessert thing up and I put it next to my computer and I'm like, you're not allowed to have that until you start writing. <laughs> Stop noodling around the computer. That thing is staring at you and you can have it as soon as you like turn to Microsoft Word and stop doing other things. <laughs> so this is important writing advice for any of you out there who want to be writers yourselves or who are writers. Sugar, dogs and sugar. I think the two essential elements to a successful writing career are have a dog if you can and have sugar if you can. But keep your important manuscripts away from the dog, is what I'm discovering also. Ooh, yikes. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure I don't need whatever that was. Next book is going to be delayed. <laughs> right. You saw it here first. I think, there's, I think there's one or two from people from Scholastic on this, so we should be careful. <laughs> No, no, they already have it. It's like, it's happening. Actually, I think we're going to reveal the cover of book 15 tomorrow. It is so pretty. Oh my God. I'm so excited. Really excited. Yeah, it's, very, I, get put it, I get to put it on Instagram. So, yeah, so it'll go up on Instagram tomorrow. Yeah, okay. I saw you posted that you you've seen the cover for Battle Dragons too. Seen the cover for Battle Dragons too. It's astonishing. I didn't think they could top this cover. This cover is so cool. Um, they did. They topped it, and I love it. And it's I can't wait to share. <laughs> they also I don't know people can't see this, but 
Well, it doesn't really translate to the screen, but the book has dragon scale end papers. Oh my god, I saw that and I was so jealous. <laughs> It's so cool. I couldn't believe it. Maeve Norton is the designer of the book, who works for Scholastic. She's amazing. I didn't know about it. It just showed up at my house, and I opened it and saw it stamped with a dragon. There's like a dragon stamp on the hardcover under the jacket that says book one. And then it's got dragon scales. What? I feel so lucky. I feel so lucky. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I can't it's take credit. Though. But, oh, it's so pretty. I just want to touch it all the time. It's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's as close as we get to having a real dragon. We'll just see in here. Pet your book. <laughs> All right, um, Kellyanne, I think we're supposed to wrap up now, right? Because it's ten fifty, so I think she's coming. Um, oh, look at the people in the chat say the cover was leaked. I know, I'm seeing that. I'm, like, I'm not going to go Google it. I'm <laughs> honored the release tomorrow. <laughs> well, tomorrow, tomorrow, everyone will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to see I, it. I, before this ends, I do want to first. I want to thank you for doing this with me. Thank you so much, the the, I, the queen of of dragons. Thank you for for reading my book and chatting with me. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Mysterious Galaxy for hosting this. I hope you will all click on that blue button and buy books from them and support <laughs> bookstores. If you have a bookstore in your community, wherever you are, please support them. Buy books. It doesn't have to be ours, though. It should be. Uh, <laughs> Buy books from your and other books. Just yeah, buy buy our books, buy other books. Um, <laughs> I hope. I mean, obviously, I hope you buy mine. I have a three-year-old. It's expensive. Um, <laughs> and dogs. And dogs. Yeah, support dogs. Um, support children. Um, well, it did my job wonderfully for me. Um, <laughs> I was just gonna come up here to tell you guys to click that green button and buy his book. So. <laughs> my job here is done. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I had so much fun watching tonight's event. You guys were so great, and I'm sure that our lovely audience had a ton of fun, too. Thank you to our audience for joining us, and one more time, because it can't hurt, if you hit that green button, you can buy Alex's book, and you can get a signed or personalized book plate by writing in your org comments who you'd like him to make that out to. So with that, I'm just going to let everyone go. Also, you guys are both champions for doing this late at night. Oh, it's so, really fun. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Thanks everyone for being here on your Thursday night. I really <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Of course. <laughs> you guys have a good one. Good night, everyone.